welcome our new member who our new member whom we'd like to formally welcome when we do get back together, but uh, Don, I believe it's pronounced Ethover. Uh, Don is the new CEO and president at Northcrest Community. So Don, welcome. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we're great. Uh, excited to have you be a part of our club. And uh, have you been on one of our virtual meetings yet, or is this your first one? This is my first one. So thank you for uh, the invitation so I could get on today, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you in person. Good. I, did I pronounce your name correctly? Close. Close. Um, F. Hoffer. F. Hoffer. Yep. Perfect. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's all right. Close is good enough on that one. <laughs> um. So yeah, welcome. And uh, like I said, when we get back together, or uh, hopefully we can hear uh, more about you and may sure. maybe make a more formal uh, welcome to the club. But thanks for Thank joining you. and thanks for being a part of our meeting today. You bet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, 53 participants. I hope uh, we have a good crowd. Uh, today, <clears throat> we're going to start off with just a a brief moment of a couple of uh, club members uh, that need a little bit of an extra uh, thought and uh, some some memory as well. So uh, I want to start off with uh, Charlie Ricketts. I, I don't know how many of you saw your email this morning, but unfortunately, uh, Charlie passed away on Sunday at the Northcrest Care Center. Uh, and Charlie uh, was a 50-year member of the Rotary Club of Ames. So when you lose a member of 50 years, you certainly uh, lose a bit of your club and a bit of history. Uh, so our, our thoughts and prayers go out to Norma and Charlie's family and all of his friends and all of uh, our club. Uh, that's just uh, um, want to make sure we take a moment to, to remember Charlie here in just a moment. Um, also, just uh, I know that last week it, it came up that uh, Brian Dieter had surgery last week, and and Brian has uh, you know reached out and and let me know that that surgery went well last week. He was out of the hospital. Uh, he's recovering, and he's very appreciative uh, for all the cards and prayers he says. Uh, and uh, is there anyone else that? Uh, in our club uh, that you feel needs uh, extra thought at this time, this, this, this day. No, so let's, let's just take a moment um, and uh, a moment of silence here uh, and uh, be appreciative of Brian's recovery, but also then just keep, uh, like I said, uh, Charlie's family and, and the memory of Charlie uh, in our thoughts as well. So let's just take a moment. Yeah, so... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we're at 55 members uh, now on our our, our call, uh, so we're getting up there. That's that's good. Uh, again, uh, I mentioned we have a couple of visitors, uh, and um, let's see. I see Loris Olson has joined us, and she's a, a visitor of the club today. Uh, I would like us all to mute ourselves. Yes, uh, to all our guests and visitors, welcome to you from Ames Rotary, now Beta London or Gay Perry, from far off Flanders or the USA. We're glad that you are here today. Come back again whenever you're near. Join us and then we'll make it clear. Around the world, you will always be welcome at Rotary. Thank you, John. Wonderful job. Uh, next week, uh, Don, I didn't mention, but our new members have to sing the song in front of everyone. So, <laughs> no, just kidding. That's our music That's team. A good thing it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's our faithful music team. Thank you, John. A uh, couple of announcements here. Um, unfortunately, as this slide shows, uh, too much heat 
too little rain. Uh, so we're calling all uh, volunteers and servants to once again help. We have two scheduled uh, waterings out of Tedesco Park and Learning Center this week. Thank you, Jim Patton, for organizing uh, this watering. And if you see there, Jim and, and the team, we need waterers for Wednesday evening at 5 p.m. We also will have a team that looks like convening Thursday morning the 16th at 7 a.m. Um, and then on the observation deck, which is on the south side of the park there, uh, near the ISU parking lot building, looks like that's where we're going to meet. Uh, and I'm assuming uh, gallon jugs of water. If you have a garden tractor you want to drive over there, that'd be awesome. Otherwise, I think they'll probably have some other materials there. But be prepared, if you would, to help us keep the trees uh, watered because this is a tough time. So thanks, Jim, uh, for organizing that. Um, another announcement, just uh, your board of directors will be meeting after this meeting at one o'clock today uh, for our scheduled July meeting. Um, and then I had a, uh, a nice note from our district governor, Steve Dakin, who was our program last week, just thanking us uh, you know, Steve, uh, after our meeting on Monday, Steve promptly went out to the Tedesco Learning Center, took a picture out there at the, uh, at the sign, but uh, he, he uh, yeah, jumped right in his car and went out there and thought what an awesome uh, park that is, what a, a good learning center opportunity that we have had as a club to volunteer locally and serve. And so he jumped right out there, but he's very uh, appreciative of all we're doing as a club. So uh, thank you uh, to the nice note from District Governor Dakin. And uh, yeah, we have an exciting program today. So I'm actually going to uh, mute myself and invite uh, Liz Beck to unmute and then introduce our speaker for today. So take it away, Liz. Thank you, Chad. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Roth, James Roth. Um, he came to Iowa State as an undergraduate in 1969, graduated from the Vet College, uh, went back and did practice in East Central Iowa for a couple years, and then returned in 77 to ISU as an adjunct professor and a graduate student. Subsequently, he received his PhD in 1981. Um, Dr. Roth lives on an acreage and he enjoys gardening and when he's isolated he gets to spend time with his wife and they have three children and four grandchildren. Um, so he's got a nice family around him um, even if they're Zooming. Dr. Roth is a, a distinguished professor in the College of Vet Medicine and he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He um, is the director of the Center for Food Security and Public Health. His primary area of research expertise is in immunity to infectious disease in food producing animals <laughs> and a bunch of charts. Um, he's testified for Congress and um, bio on biosecurity preparedness on efforts to address bioterrorism, agroterrorism, and on the need for vaccines for foreign animal diseases. So this talk is incredibly relevant to us. And welcome, Dr. Roth, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Liz, and thank you for inviting me. Um, everybody is very aware of the COVID human pandemic that's going on, and, and Liz asked me to talk about uh, some of our work with animal pandemics and at the <clears throat> Center for Food Security and Public Health, that's what we spend a lot of time on. Most of them just affect animals, but some affect people also. So I'll be uh, making a few remarks about why we're seeing so many pandemics and then discuss three specific diseases of swine that are, are uh, of great concern. We don't have them here yet and we hope we don't get them. Iowa's the number one swine state, so it's something we have to pay a lot of attention to. Um, we are living in a period of emerging diseases, and nearly all of them are zoonotic. In other words, they jump from people or animals into people. 
Um, and this is over the last 40 years, starting with HIV, the AIDS pandemic, uh, Lyme disease, mad cow disease, um, avian influenza, Nipah virus, which I'll talk about, um, and others leading up in Zika, leading up to COVID. So in the last 40 years, we've seen a lot of new diseases that we didn't have to deal with before. Um, and we have to assume that in the next 40 years, we'll have a similar list of diseases that we don't currently know about because diseases are emerging faster and faster in people and in animals. Um, <clears throat> and I should warn you, this, this talk can be a bit of a downer. So uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a happy topic, but it's a topic that we need to pay attention to. We're also seeing uh, animal diseases emerge at a faster rate as well. And here's some for various animals. Uh, I'm going to focus today on three diseases of swine, African swine fever, Nipah virus, and Ebola virus. So why are we seeing so many new diseases emerging um, in animals and people? And that the fundamental reason, in my opinion, is the rapidly expanding human population. <clears throat> Infectious diseases uh, really thrive when there are large numbers of susceptible uh, individuals that have no immunity, and we're seeing that with COVID right now. Um, and many of these animal diseases that we don't have in the U.S., our animals have no immunity, so if they get in, we would expect they would spread rapidly. Um, it's the fundamental issue is the expanding human population and the need to produce more and more food animals. Some of that is with intensive animal agriculture with large numbers of animals in, uh, being intensively raised. We have a lot of that in the US. And increased backyard production in many countries. And both of these methods have advantages and disadvantages uh, and are needed to produce the protein to feed the human population. But by having more and more animals, then the animal diseases thrive more also. A big issue is <clears throat> viruses, especially jumping from wildlife into domestic animals and or people. And that's what happened with COVID. It apparently came out of perhaps bats in China at uh, domestic markets, jumping into people and then adapting to people and spreading, as we know, very wild, widely through people. Uh, environmental degradation, especially in the tropics with the rainforest, leads to more interaction between the animals in the rainforest and domestic animals and people, leading to disease transfer. Climate change is, is adding to the evolution of, of diseases, especially into more northern climates as they warm up. And then globalization allows these diseases to travel around the globe very rapidly, uh, as we've seen with COVID. COVID. Um, and one of the main ways we're dealing with COVID is to shut down global transportation to try and stop it from spreading so rapidly around the world. <clears throat> This shows the rapid growth of the world population by region from 1820 to in a 200-year span to 2019. Um, the human population has increased everywhere, but especially in Asia. That's where the big increase has been. And this shows the increase in meat and egg production from 1961 to 2018. Uh, 1961 is when I was growing up on an Iowa farm raising all of these different species. And there's been a tremendous increase uh, in production in order to feed the human population. And as I mentioned, infectious diseases uh, really thrive in large populations where they can spread rapidly from one animal to another or one person to another. And if the human population continues to grow, these numbers are going to have to continue to grow if everyone's going to have a similar diet to what they have now. This shows um, meat production in some countries, some continents. And what's really remarkable here is if we look at China. In 1962, there was very little uh, 
meat of any type produced in China. And China has expanded their meat production tremendously to where they, and their human population has also increased, but they've really increased meat production and food producing animals. Uh, swine uh, are the major species in China for, for meat production. China has, in 2018, China had half of the pigs in the world um, to feed their population. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about three diseases of swine that threaten global food security and public health. Um, these are very long stories, and I'm going to condense them into a very short period of time, just to hit the highlights. African swine fever, Nipah virus, and Ebola virus. African swine fever has been around for decades, but typically only in Africa, and it stayed in Africa mostly until 2007 when it, it got into the Caucasus by pork from a ship being fed to pigs in the port, and the pork wasn't fully cooked, and the pigs got African swine fever, and then it spread uh, into um, uh, Eastern Europe and Asia. And then in 2018, uh, it spread into China, where half the pigs in the world are, and then it just exploded. And from China, it spread into most of the rest of Southeast Asia. Uh, it has a high fatality rate. Up to 90% of the pigs that contract this virus will die. Uh, and half the pigs in China died. The estimate is, it's hard to get good data out of China, but the estimate is half of them died. So that would be a fourth of all the pigs in the world have died from this virus since 2018. The fortunate thing is this virus only infects pigs, doesn't infect people or any other species. So that's very fortunate. There is no vaccine. This is a tough virus to make a vaccine against. Uh, researchers have been trying for decades and have not succeeded. There is some hopeful activity now that maybe uh, in a few years there may be a vaccine. So this shows uh, in China, the first case was on August 3rd, 2018, a single case, rapidly spread through the swine producing regions of China, killed about half the pigs in China. Then it spread to these other countries in Southeast Asia, where pork is also a very important source of food. This is uh, estimates because, as I said, you can't get official figures out of China. But estimates of pork production in um, millions of metric tons in China in 2017 before the disease, and then the disease hit in 2018, and they've lost about 23 million metric tons of pork uh, into 2020 so far. The red bar is the total pork production in the US. Um, they've lost about twice as much as our total pork production. So if they imported all of our pork, it would only replace half of what they've lost. The green bar is the exports of pork from the US. So it's having a, a huge impact in China on food security. This shows uh, prices as of July 8th, 2020. Um, the Iowa, Minnesota average price was 20 cents a pound live weight for pigs, which is very low partially or in large part because COVID has caused problems with processing plants. So there's a surplus of pigs waiting to go to processing. Um, so the price has dropped dramatically. And in China, the price has gone up. It's tenfold higher for a live pig in China than in for the US. Uh, and COVID is a big part of that. African swine fever is a bigger part. Uh, the trade war with China didn't help. So there's a big disparity. And then if you also look at Vietnam and South Korea, their, their pig prices are way up compared to the US. So we would, it, livestock farmers are having a really tough time in the US now, partially because of COVID. And we'd really like to be able to get these animals to the parts of the world that really need them. So as I mentioned, I briefly talk about my activities related to each of these three diseases with one slide. Um, the World Organization for Animal Health in Paris 
has uh, about 180 member countries, nearly all the countries in the world belong to it, and they set the rules on trade in animals and animal products between countries in the world uh, for the World Trade Organization. And they appointed an ad hoc group to develop, uh, revise the plans for compartmentalization on African swine fever, and I'm a member of that group. And compartmentalization is where a production system in the US, for example, if we get African swine fever, how can they prove their negative so they could continue to export? Uh, and that involves a lot of biosecurity and surveillance and other activities. Um, and this has to be agreed to by the various member countries. So there's a lot of, a lot of meetings around this. Um, my center is also working on the secure pork supply plans. We're leading those efforts, working with USDA, state animal health officials in the swine industry on how to respond to three foreign animal diseases in pigs, foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, and African swine fever. None of these affect people, which is very fortunate. They're not zoonotic, uh, but they would have a devastating impact on agriculture, uh, Iowa, which produces approximately 30% of all the pigs in the U.S., would really, really be impacted. So we're designing biosecurity, surveillance, and response activities if one of these diseases should come into the U.S. Nipah virus is a zoonotic virus that affects pigs and people. Uh, and it first appeared in 1998-1999 in Malaysia. It was unknown before that. Uh, it produced a respiratory and neurologic syndrome in pigs, and it spread rapidly among swine. So it was rapidly transmitted among swine. And then uh, people working with the pigs started getting sick and dying. Uh, before the outbreak was over, about 250 people got sick, about 100 of them died. That's about a 40% uh, death rate. They thought it was Japanese encephalitis virus, which affects pigs and people, but it wasn't. And they discovered a brand new virus, which they called Nipah virus. Uh, the virus was discovered in March of 99. Um, there was a quick response by the Malaysian government, aided by US CDC and by Australia, who sent veterinarians there to help them. And they ended up killing or calling 1.1 million pigs in Malaysia fairly quickly out of a total of 2.4 million. So they killed nearly half the pigs in Malaysia to stop this virus. Um, and there are no new, have been no new cases since 1999, which at the time it wasn't certain whether this would be stamped out or if it would keep coming back. So in 20 years, it hasn't come back in pigs. But nearly every year, there are cases in Bangladesh and India with direct transmission from fruit bats, which carry this virus, to people. And usually it's 15 or 20 people that get it. Uh, some human-to-human -human transmission among families, but not efficiently transmitted. This is one of the first farms in Malaysia to come down with Nipah virus. This is an area of the country that had never had pigs before, and a uh, company started intensive swine production in this area, about 20,000 hogs. And there are a lot of fruit bats in these limestone cliff formations. And we now know that fruit bats carry the virus. Uh, these are about a foot long. They only eat fruit. Um, and they carry the virus without getting sick. And a very rare event happened that the virus jumped from fruit bats into pigs, then spread very quickly among the pigs and then from pigs to people. Um, <clears throat> this shows the geographic range of the fruit bats and some locations where they found the virus in fruit bats, but not yet in pigs or people. And you'll notice that uh, Southeastern China has had some positive fruit bats. And that's where 50% of the pigs of the world are. So there's huge concern that if this virus would jump from fruit bats into pigs again and spread like it did in Malaysia, it could be a real catastrophe. 20 years that hasn't happened, so we're hoping it never happens. 
Um, but there is, um, hope is not the best strategy. So there is a need for an effective vaccine for Nipah virus in pigs. If this virus should ever get in pigs in a swine dense region, we would need a swine vaccine to prevent transmission among the pigs, prevent transmission from pigs to people, preserve smallholder investments in swine, because in that area, a lot of the pigs are backyard pigs. And that uh, is a big part of the wealth of the people is the pigs they own, and maintain food security. What would be the impact of Nipah virus in the US? Now, fortunately, we don't have those fruit bats. Malaysia had 2.4 million pigs and 23 and a half million people because it's a predominantly Muslim country and it's only the Indian and Chinese minorities that eat pork. Iowa has 22 million pigs and 3.2 million people. So it's kind of the inverse. We would have a much larger issue in Iowa. But again, it's not anywhere in this hemisphere do we have those fruit bats. So that should protect us. So my activities related to Nipah. Uh, during the outbreak, I was invited to Malaysia by the Veterinary Research Institute there and asked to help develop a swine vaccine for Nipah virus. Uh, by the time I got there, it was early 2000 and the outbreak was over. I find that's the best time to show up at deadly outbreaks is after they're over. Um, and they did ask if, if I could help with vaccine development. The, this is a very long story, uh, but we did develop two vaccine candidates and published on them, one with uh, Mariel, a vaccine company, and one with Soetis. But after the proof of concept, there was no funding to go ahead and develop and stockpile vaccine because there's no market. So a commercial company won't develop a vaccine with no market, and we couldn't find government agencies to fund it. So there's still no commercial vaccine, even though we know it would be fairly easy to produce vaccine. The third one is Ebola virus. Uh, Ebola virus is also a zoonotic virus. It affects people. Um, <clears throat> Ebola that you may remember from 2014, there was a very large outbreak in Africa, it killed about 11,000 people. And a few cases came to the US for treatment in high biosecurity health settings. Uh, it, it's rare, but very severe, often fatal illness in humans. It's transmitted to people from wild animals uh, in Africa, perhaps fruit bats, perhaps other animals, we don't know for sure. And then it spreads human to human fairly efficiently. So once it jumps to people, they have to find it and, and stop the transmission. The average case fatality rate is about 50%, so about half the people have died who get this virus. And in the most recent outbreak, which is just now coming to an end, there, there have been two human vaccines, uh, experimental vaccines tried, and they look promising. So hopefully we'll have a human vaccine produced in high quantities to help help deal with this in people. This shows uh, the first case of Ebola emerged in 1976. And since then, there have been many outbreaks in Africa um, that have all been brought under control by rapid responses from public health officials in Africa and from the World Health Organization and developed countries. <clears throat> so the question came up, well, will Ebola virus affect pigs. We know that there's a, a related virus that doesn't make pigs or people sick, but is closely related that does infect pigs. So people in Winnipeg, Canada, in the biosafety level four facility there, if infected some pigs with the really hot Ebola virus from Africa and discovered that it does cause severe respiratory disease in pigs and that pigs transmit it from one pig to another. Um, a scary feature of this is that Ebola virus in people is a hemorrhagic disease you really can't miss. The symptoms are really very dramatic. In pigs, it just causes a respiratory disease like any other respiratory disease. So we may not know we have it um, because it would look like other respiratory diseases in pigs. And, and we may not know we have it until people start getting it from the pigs. 
Then in Canada, they did the next experiment, which was to infect pigs in one of their biosafety level four rooms and put four macaques, monkeys, in the same room in separate cages. And what they found was that the Ebola virus was transmitted from pigs to all four macaques without direct contact. So this is evidence we'd have to worry that pigs might transmit it to people. Never happened. We've never seen Ebola virus in pigs. It's never been detected in the wild. And if it's happening in Africa, we don't know it. So my activities related to Ebola is just peripheral. Uh, I have a PhD student, uh, Dr. Chuck Lewis, a veterinarian, who's conducting his research on a related virus, the Bundibugyo Ebola virus in pigs in Canada at their biosafety level four facility. We don't have a BL4 facility in the US for doing pig research. One is being built in Manhattan, Kansas, where we'll, we would be able to do pigs and cattle and horses. But right now, we need to depend on Canada to do research on these kind of agents. And they've been very cooperative. They've been great to work with. And so I have a PhD student. He did his coursework at Iowa State. He's doing his research up there. So with that, very quick overview. Um, I warned you it's a bit depressing. Um, but there is good work being done and, and a lot of preparedness to try and be ready for these uh, diseases. So with that, I guess we'll see if there are questions. Thank you, Dr. Roth. That was very informative. Um, if people have questions and they would want to put them in the chat to everyone, uh, I'll try to make sure that we keep an eye on those. Uh, or if you could uh, raise your hand and I could also call on you uh, from the participant window as well. Uh, any, any questions so far for Dr. Roth? And I'll mention that my email address is on this slide if people would like to contact me. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question from Mark Edelman. So Mark, I'm just going to ask you to go ahead and unmute if you would and go ahead and ask Dr. Roth your question. Uh, Dr. Roth, um, <clears throat> does Iowa State get any funding through uh, the WHO and how important is WHO to anything that Iowa State does in this area of research? Um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of funding from WHO. They're not primarily a funding organization. Their budget is pretty tight. It's getting much, much tighter with uh, the potential of the U.S. withdrawing from WHO. So they're, as far as a source of research funding, they're not a major source, but they are a huge uh, source for leadership and expertise. So they play a big role in bringing countries together and bringing scientists together to decide how to deal with these issues. Okay. The second have question, a, second oh, question I have uh, uh, really relates to, uh, I know down in Texas that uh, they have hunting seasons for feral pigs. Uh, does uh, the feral pig issue uh, factor into this, uh, the swine disease around the world very much? Uh, yes, and in, in the U.S. it's a huge concern. It's estimated we may have six million feral pigs in the U.S. or more, mostly in the southern half of the U.S. Um, out to the west coast. California has a lot. We have plans in place, the USDA does, and states and researchers, to deal with these diseases in domestic swine. Uh, if it the diseases get into feral swine, they're very difficult to, to deal with, as you can imagine. So feral pigs are a huge concern um, for these diseases. Thank you for those <laughs> questions. Uh, I think uh, Liz Beck had a question for you. Is there a new, isn't there a new swine virus that was just announced in China? So there's uh, a new influenza virus, a new strain of influenza in China that has, uses receptors on cells that could also be used on human cells. 
And that's what they look for in influenza. You know, we have a lot of swine influenza, a lot of avian influenza. Most of those viruses can't bind to the human receptor and infect human cells. Um, you probably remember in 2009, there was a, a virus influenza that emerged in Mexico. It was called a swine flu, but what it actually was, was a virus that had gene segments from pigs and from birds and from people. It was a hybrid. So it wasn't, it was a human influenza, but it had parts of swine influenza. Uh, there's huge concern that this new virus or some other influenza virus can emerge and become a human virus that, that could be uh, very devastating. You know, I'm sure everybody's aware of the 1918 influenza. So this is something they're paying close attention to. This virus, they said it's been around for about four years and hasn't really affected people yet but uh, it may be only one mutation away from becoming more infectious for people. I'm gonna try to get these questions to you in order here. Uh, is there currently a ban on import of feed additives from, uh, for swine from China? Um, the, there is major concern about importing feed. We think we got a, a pig coronavirus from feed in 2013 from China, we don't know that for sure. Um, I'm not sure there's a ban on feed. They're watching it very closely. Uh, a problem is some of the micronutrients and vitamins, one of the only good sources is China. They, they uh, produce a lot of the vitamins and micronutrients that we need for our feed. So there's, a, there's research going on how to uh, detected in feed, how to treat the feed to kill the virus. Thank you. And then Loris Olson has a question. Loris, I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself and ask your question also to Dr. Roth. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We heard a lot about African swine fever. And last year in a trip, a lobbying trip to uh, D.C., um, uh, I and another uh, county supervisor, along with uh, various people in the business community, um, had an occasion, an opportunity to meet with USDA officials. And they were very concerned about the threat, the, the, spread, uh, the spread of that. So now we don't hear anything. So what is our threat level now? For, uh, for African swine fever and how quickly does it spread? What, what kind of response would we have to take on the county level? Because uh, we have been informed by USDA that the county will be responsible for disposing of the pigs. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's still as big a threat as it was uh, several months ago. But, but now the, the attention is focused on COVID, so we aren't hearing about it. But the threat is still there and it's still just as big. Um, and the USDA and states and, and through our center, we're working on it also, still developing plans and refining them for how we would respond. A key will be finding it early, uh, if and when it gets here. And our diagnostic lab is now set up to detect it as are, are the other veterinary diagnostic labs. So we're getting in better shape. Um, a major concern with these foreign animal diseases is uh, when it gets in, uh, the, about one of the only ways to handle it now without vaccine is to, to euthanize all of the animals. Um, and prices would drop dramatically. And how counties in Iowa could handle all of those pigs is a big question. Uh, it, it would be a really big challenge. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we have a question also from Louis uh, Bannett. If you could also then unmute yourself, Louis, and go ahead and ask your question. Or is your question might be, uh, has any research been done at ISU? Uh, number of viral particles necessary for infection? Question mark. Um, <clears throat> We can't do any research at ISU on any of these three viruses. Um, 
African swine fever is a biosafety level three, and it's a select agent. With a lot of permissions, we might be able to work on that one. Um, the only two places in the U.S. are Plum Island in New York and Manhattan, Kansas in their new facility working on African swine fever. Ebola and Nipah are biosafety level four and there's nowhere in the U.S. that we can work on those in pigs uh, in containment. So we're, we're really limited in what we can do. Are, are you aware of, are you aware of uh of the question regarding the number of viral particles, it probably varies by disease, but uh, it certainly is important in our current epidemic. Uh, yes, and there, um, it's hard to know the minimum number. The, when we do research to determine the infectious dose of a virus, how many viral particles, you do ID 50, infectious dose for 50%. So what number of virus particles will infect half of the animals? What's really important for these diseases where we don't have them in the US and one case would be uh, devastating because we'd lose all our exports is what's the infectious dose for one out of a thousand pigs uh, if there's a thousand pigs on a farm? And that's an unknowable number. Uh, but that dose is probably pretty small. What would it take to infect one pig, which then spreads it to all the others? Thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll take one last question here. It looks like uh, we have a question asking, if you can ballpark this, how long in average months or years does it take to develop and distribute new vaccines for animals or humans? Well, for animals, it can be relatively quick. Uh, with West, when West Nile virus came in, and I think it was the late 90s, within a year and a half, there was a vaccine available for horses. We still don't have a vaccine for people. Uh, so animal vaccines can be much quicker if it's an easy virus. Nipah and Ebola are easy to make vaccines against. African swine fever is very tough. Uh, like HIV, for decades, there have been hundreds of millions of dollars spent, probably billions, and we still don't have a vaccine. COVID seems to be medium in there, that uh, hopefully not terribly difficult, also not a slam dunk. So it depends. And with COVID, they're speeding it up. Normally, it would take years to develop a human vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roth. We know that you, uh, I'm sure, um, because of what's going on, you're a very busy man, and we appreciate you taking time to address our club. Uh, it was very informative and timely, so thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Um, and I think uh, we've got, uh, let's see, Karen, you're going to put up our quote for the day. Is that right? There we go. So Karen found this quote um, from Rotary International Convention, which seems very appropriate. So um, there are people on this planet whose lives are better now because you traverse the earth. And it doesn't matter if they know that or not. It doesn't matter if they even know your name or not. What really matters is that your work touched lives, that it left people healthier, happier, better than they were before. How fitting that quote would be for the work that Dr. Roth and his colleagues do. How fitting that quote is for all of our uh, Rotary Club of Ames uh, as servants uh, locally and throughout the world. And also as we think about uh, Charlie Ricketts and you know his time here, 50 years a, a servant. Uh, so this is very applicable quote for all. And, uh, and then before we go into the uh, four-way test. Uh, you remember District Governor Steve Dakin said every Monday, check your email. He's going to be sending you uh, his joke of the week. Um, these are not edited or filtered ahead of time, so they come in from Governor, uh, District Governor Steve Dakin as is. Uh, his quote for the week was, whoever decided a liquor store is more essential than a hair salon is obviously a bald-headed alcoholic. 
Uh, obviously, that's in response to the priorities of the COVID. Uh, and before we get to the four-way tests as well, I was thinking about food and I was thinking about safety and Dr. Roth, and it made me think also of just a brief story where uh, a boy at dinner time asked his father, he said, hey, dad, are bugs good to eat? And his father said, hey, hey, this is dinner time. That's gross. We're not going to talk about that during dinner. And so afterwards, he circled back with his son. The father said, hey, what were you? You said you wanted to ask me about something, uh, but I shut, you know, during dinner, it just wasn't a good time. What did you want to say? And he said, oh, it was nothing. You just had a bug in your soup, but it's gone now. So on that note, uh, we're going to talk about the four-way test. And as Governor Dakin said, uh, he would also like to remind us that there's a fifth element in the end. Uh, but uh, in all that we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And his fifth test is, will it be fun? So uh, just remember that uh, in, in these times where we're, we're going through some challenges, but uh, Hey, will it be fun? So everybody uh, have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Uh, we, have, uh, we do have a program next week. And uh, so we'll look forward to being virtually with you again. So thanks a lot.